Okay, so in this one for reviewing, down at the bottom, I kind of put like this, like sort of a short, a short note for yourself. You always look at the reactants, look at the products, find one of, just pick a reactant. It doesn't matter which one. Pick a reactant, find the most similar product. So you're looking on opposite sides and then you're looking to see what happens. The one that loses its hydrogen ion, that is an acid. And on the product side, its pair is the conjugate base. The one that gains a hydrogen ion is a base, and on the opposite side of the reaction, the product pair is the conjugate acid. So if I look at H3PO4, what is most like H3PO4? H2PO4, okay? So you see that they're the most similar looking reactant and product. So then ask yourself, does H3PO4 gain or lose a hydrogen ion? Mm -hmm, it loses, so that means it is a, an acid. So that means H2PO4 is the, mm -hmm. and remember on the product side, it's always called the conjugate as a way of describing that acts as a base in the reverse reaction. Then if you look at H2O, the most similar on the product side is H3O plus. So you see that it mm -hmm, gains a hydrogen ion, which means that it is a base. So therefore H3O plus is the, the conjugate acid. Okay? So kind of like follow the steps. Looking at the bottom one, CO3 2 minus. What looks the most like CO3 2 minus? Mm -hmm. So HCO3 2 minus. So what happens to CO3 2 minus? Mm -hmm. So if I compare reactant side, when I look at the product side, do you see that it gains a hydrogen ion? In the forward reaction, that means it is a, it's, an, it's a base. That means that HCO3 minus is the, this is the conjugate acid. Then looking at H2O, you see that H2O, OH minus is the, the most like H2O. So that means that it, mm-hmm. So do you see that H2O loses a hydrogen ion and becomes a hydroxide ion? So that means that it is a acid. So that means OH minus is the conjugate base. Okay, so that's identifying those weak acids and bases when they have a reaction. They typically don't just form a salt and water they end up forming a conjugate acid and base that then can reverse, um, can have a reverse reaction and reform those products. So you end up with equilibrium there. The second thing that we did is we were talking about pH and how to calculate pH. So here's a question. What is the pH of a sample of sodium hydroxide if it has a hydrogen ion concentration of 1.45 times 10 to the minus 10? Okay, so remember, if I know the concentration pH is equal to minus the log of the acid concentration. So in this one, it really just depends on what kind of calculator you have. I have to put this in the calculator as 1.45 EE minus 12. Then I take the log and then I take the plus minus. So I have to do it like backwards. You have to put in the number first. So 1.45 EE negative 12. Then I take the log and I get a negative 11.838632, which I gotta make positive, right? So that, that plus minus at the end just changes the sign. Everybody put it in their calculator and get that. Anybody not get that? Because you just got to make sure that you know how to put it in the calculator. You should put 1.45. You press the EE button, and then you should have the two little zeros show up. You put it in a negative 12. Then you just take the log, and you'll get 
and hit the plus minus to change the sign. How many significant figures in this? Mm -hmm. Should have three, right? So C1.45 has three significant figures. So I'm going to keep that one 11.8. Next number is a three, so that'll just round down. So 11.8 is going to be the pH. So would you think of this as being a strong acid, a strong base, a weak acid, or a weak base? If it has a pH of 11.8. On the pH scale, we'll talk about pH in a sec. So on the pH scale, remember that it goes from 0 to 7 and then all the way up to 14. Anything that is about like 0 to 3 is really strongly acidic. Down low, stomach acid, those kinds of things. Anything that's really from 3 all the way up to 6.99 is really more of a mild acid. If it's exactly at 7, then that's neutral. When you go above 7, now that's basic. But if it's close to 7, then that's going to be mildly basic. So really, anywhere from 7 to 10 is considered a mild base. And anything above 10, anything in that 10 to 14 range, that's really pretty strongly basic. So that means those that are on the ends are going to have lots of hydrogen ions or lots of hydroxide ions. Those are the ones that tend to be more corrosive, more irritating. You try to limit your exposure to ones that have a lot of acidity or a high basic character. So 11.8 would be what? Mm -hmm. So this would really be a strong base. Lots of hydroxide ions. So this next one, what is the hydrogen ion concentration of a substance with a pH of 8.35? So this one we're going in reverse because we know the pH and we want to find the hydrogen ion concentration. So this, if I take, so the acid concentration is equal to the second log of a negative pH. So when you go to put this in your calculator, you've got to put the pH in first. If you have the graph old, if you have the old calculator, you've got to put the pH in first, then make it negative, then hit the second button in log. So that's that 10 to the X is what you end up using. That's what they call the inverse log. So it is sort of like one over the log. That's what that inverse means. So in solving this, you put 8.35, make it negative. Then you hit the second button in the log button. And I got 4.46683522 times 10 to the minus ninth, and that would be molar. Now, if you put the yours in, you might have just gotten a 0 0.00000004, right? Do you, is that what you got? You didn't get 0 0.00000004? Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. So that's just because you're in the regular flow, flow. Somebody told me what that stands for. Now I can't remember again. Like the non, the, the non, Scientific, so to go to scientific notation, hit second and the number five. Okay. So second and the number five, we'll put it in scientific notation. And second and the number four, we'll put it in back into the normal notation. Yeah, so this So this is on the, my calculators. So if you hit second and five, it'll put it in scientific notation. If you hit second and four, it'll put it back into non-scientific notation. 
but you need to have scientific notation because you've got to be able to round this. So in this answer, how many significant figures should my answer have? Three. Mm -hmm. Because 8.35 has three significant figures, so I want to keep that 4.46. Next number's a six, so that's going to round to what? Mm -hmm. So that's going to be 4.47 times 10 to the minus ninth molar. If you have a graphing calculator, you have to go to mode to change from scientific to non-scientific. You have to use the mode button. But in mine, if you use a, the second button in the number five, you see that the green SCI is at the top. If you hit second to number four, it'll shift it back. So with the pH of 8.35, is this a strongly acidic, strongly basic, weakly acidic, weakly basic, or is it neutral? If it's got a pH of 8.35, it's weakly basic. Just a little bit above 7, not too far above 7. So some of the ones to, to compare it to, if you look at the pH scale, the scale goes from 0 to 14. I mean, it says minus one, but honestly, the pH scale stops at zero. So zero all the way up to 14, with seven being right in the middle. There are some examples of things that fall along the scale. So I told you things that are below pH of three. These are things that have more hydrogen ions. So when you come in contact with them, they are more reactive. Lemon juice, vinegar, um, stomach acid is really down around a pH of 1. These are just naturally occurring acids and bases. But they call these strong bases. They say that they are strongly basic because they make lots of hydrogen ions. When you get above three, now you start to get into the like tomato, coffee, rainwater, milk, saliva. You start getting into what they call a mild acid because it makes some hydrogen ions. The closer you get to seven, the fewer hydrogen ions they have. They're still described as being mildly acidic. Just some examples of them. Anything that's about 3 up to about 6.99. Exactly at 7, this is water. Because remember that water can act as an acid or a base, that it has equal numbers of hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions, and that's where it's pH. It was sort of like what the scale is based on. As you go above, things above 7 all the way up to 10, they call these mild bases, or they say they're mildly basic. And remember that if they're mild, then that means that there's less hydroxide ion compared to those that are above 10 are going to start having larger and larger concentrations of hydrogen ions. So things like oven cleaner, Drano, falls into this category. Hair remover, like if you ever used Nair, Nair is like, it actually dissolves the hair itself, which is why it comes out. Ammonia, another example. Bleach is right in there. And these, they describe them as being strongly basic because they make lots, lots of hydroxide ions. So things that are strongly acidic, strongly basic, you try to kind of limit your physical exposure to them because they will react with body tissues and cause irritation. You try not to ingest too much of them because of that irritation that they can give, they can cause it like into your stomach, your mouth. So I gave the analogy, I have a little nephew, and when he was little, he has three older sisters. So when he was a baby, they thought it was funny to give him lemons because of the sour face that he would make. Well, he actually like acquired a taste for lemons. And so he would actually put like slices of lemon in his mouth and sit there and suck on it. So first time he went to the dentist, they said, what does this kid eat? 
And one of the things that he asked, he was like, does he eat lemons? And they're like, yeah, he loves lemons. And he said, no more lemons for him because he is dissolving the enamel on his teeth. So lemon juice has that kind of strength, can actually dissolve. And that's one of the reasons when you brush your teeth with fluoride, you help to decrease the dissolving of enamel from the surface of the teeth. That's really one of the benefits of fluoride. But that was my nephew. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, he's going to have little nubs. And I mean, these were his baby teeth, but even still they were like, he, he won't have any baby teeth if he doesn't stop eating lemons because the lemon juice is a strong acid and has the ability to do that. Okay. So let's practice another one. So what is the pH of a 2.5 times 10 to the minus six molar nitric acid solution? So you want to know pH. You work your calculator straight through. Graphing calculators, you hit minus, then log, then the acid concentration and equals. But would the acid be 2.5 to 10 to the That's not the answer. That's the concentration. I mean, okay. That, so the acid is 2.5. What you got? Nope. I got 5.602. 5.602. Two zero five nine 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 one. So in the old calculator, you put two point five EE six with the negative. Is that acting crazy? You can't put okay, so in that you've got to put the number in first. You can't put the so Old calculators have to have a number to do a function to. So you can't just hit log. If you hit log, it'll tell you error. You've got to put the number in first. Okay? So you want to make sure you write your you write down your steps yeah, okay. so that you do it each time. So in this, if you have one of the old calculators, you have to put 2.5, then EE, then a 6 and make it negative. See, everybody has that EE -E button, then a negative six, then the log button, then the plus minus button. So my answer came up negative. Did you make it a negative? Did you do a minus log of? Or did you just do log? You have to hit that, that plus minus button down next to the equal sign. Mm -hmm. You have to put that in first. You hit that, that minus sign, then log, and then the acid concentration. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with this, you tell me how many significant figures should my answer have? Two. Just two. So that 5.6. And is this a strong acid, weak acid, neutral, strong base, or weak base? 5.6. It's a mild acid. Mm -hmm. So this is a mild acid. Anything above 3 up to 6.99 is a mild acid. Anything below 3 is a strong acid. So if a H2O, if a sulfuric acid solution has a pH of 3.80, what is its concentration? So this is the reverse. So in this one, if I know the pH and I want to know the acid concentration... It is going to equal the inverse, which is the second button. It's the inverse log of the negative pH. So when I go to put this in, I put in the pH, make it negative, and then hit the second button and log. Mm -hmm. You put yours in straight away. So you hit your shift or second button, mm -hmm. your log button, and then your minus 3.80, right? You know the minus is that plus minus, like a negative 3.80. So this one, I have to put in a negative 3.80, and then I have to hit the second button and then the log button and equals. That's how I do it with the old calculator. 3.8 mm -hmm. has to be a negative 3.80, 
Uh huh. And I got one point inverse in second. And then there's some calculators that have shift. God bless. Okay. All of those mean exactly the same thing. A shift button, an inverse button, and a, a second button are all the same for 90% of calculators. Not the one on your t laptop, though. <laughs> the one on the laptop has two different buttons because I found that out this weekend trying to help a student. <laughs> I was like, oh, no. <laughs> Four, eight, nine, three, one, nine, two times 10 to the minus fourth, and that would be molar. Did everybody get that? Anybody not get that? So on your calculator, 3.80, make it negative, then hit second and log. Do you get that now? Clear? Uh-huh, 3.80, make it a negative number, mm -hmm. then hit second and log. No? Oh, okay, now hit second and number five. Second and number five, the number five. Uh-huh, you got to go to Psy. I was like, what? <laughs> I just watched you do it. I know you didn't mess it up, okay? So remember, so write yourself a note. Second and four takes out exponent or scientific notation. Second and five puts it in notation, okay? So that's how I can switch it back and forth. How many significant figures? Three. Okay. So I'm going to keep that. The one, the five, and the eight. Next is the four. So what happens? It just stays, right? So it drops off. Times 10 to the minus fourth. Don't forget to keep the exponent value. So that times 10 to the minus fourth molar it stays. That times 10 to the minus fourth. Got to make sure that you keep whatever's after your E, if you have a graphing calculator, or what's in the little little numbers in the upper corner, if you have one of mine. So you tell me 3.80, is this a strong acid, mild acid, neutral, strong base, or a mild base? Mm -hmm. 3.80, it is a mild acid. Anything above three, mm -hmm. so this would also fall into the mild acid. Just trying to get you to kind of think about that pH scale. When you see a pH value, think about the pH scale and what, what's that telling you about the amount of hydrogen ions. We found the pH, and that's how we identified that it was a mild acid. Second one, we're given the pH. We're really working backwards. Third one, if an H a hydrochloric acid solution has a pH of 6.34, what is its concentration? So you see if you can do this one. You have to put in the negative pH. So you, you have to hit second log negative 6.34. Every time. Every time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the graphing calculator, you are going to actually follow this exactly in order and also this exactly in order. And instead of inverse, you hit second. Okay, inverse and second, mm -hmm. same thing. But other than that, you put it in, in the order that it's written. But a gra the old calculators, I have to put a number in first. So I have to put in negative 6.34, then hit second, and then log. You put in second log negative 6.34. You just write it. You just do it straight across. So I ended up getting, and you tell me if this matched yours, I got 4.57. 0881896 times 10 to the minus 7th, and that would be a molar concentration. Yes? Everybody get that? Anybody not? Okay. okay. So, how many significant figures? Three. Three, right? So, come on. Okay. 
So four point the four point five seven times ten to the negative seven. So I'm going to keep the four point five seven next number to zero, so all that just drops off. pH of six point three four. This is a what? Mild. Mild. No, it's not a base. Three to six point nine nine. Anything below seven is an acid. Uh huh. Gotta remember, zero to seven is an acid. Seven to 14 is a base. So seven is that cutoff. So anything below seven, you know it's an acid. And if it's below three, it's a strong acid. If it's a three to seven, it's a mild. And if it's exactly seven, it's neutral. Hmm? Three to, three to 6.99. But seven is neutral. Huh? And seven is neutral. If it's exactly seven, then that's neutral. Mm -hmm. So it is, where do we put it? Here. Okay, so you could kind of say, so 0 to 3, very acidic. That's why, it's because I wrote this wrong. Yeah, I, I, I put it right on my paper, though. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I hope I said it right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Strongly right? acidic is 0 to 3, mildly acidic is 3 to 6.999. 7 is neutral. 7.01 up to 10 is mildly basic, and then 10 to 14 is that strongly basic. Mm -hmm. So the last topic in this chapter is taking this pH and making the connection to the health aspect, which is the blood. So the pH of the blood in this 0 to 14 scale is very narrow. It's a range. It's not an exact number. It is a range between 7.35 to 7.45. And it is very strictly controlled, even though you look at this big scale and you're like, wow, that's like only a tenth of a pH point. On a scale of 0 to 14, the blood pH stays this tightly managed. Why? Because if the pH changes, that can cause changes in cell function. That can cause permanent changes that can actually lead to cell death. So if the blood pH goes above 7.45, that is the term that is called alkalosis. Okay? Alkalosis really just means too much base. So above 7.45, it's alkalosis. Alkalosis actually hyperstimulates the nervous system. So it causes the nerve to randomly send impulses. So this person gets very kind of anxious acting, may seem kind of jittery, they might tremble. If the blood pH continues to go up, they may actually have convulsions. Worst case scenario, they can actually develop a heart arrhythmia because you know that your heart is managed by nerves as well. So the heart can get overstimulated and that can lead to fibrillation and that can cause death. Okay, so this doesn't happen at 7.46. This happens when you have this shift, especially if the shift happens too fast. If the pH goes below 7.35, then they call that acidosis. It's still basic, but they'd refer to it as acidosis because it's too much acid compared to what it should be. Instead of being between 7.35 to 7.45, dropping below 7.35 has the opposite effect on the nervous system. So instead of your nervous system causing like random nerve impulses, it actually depresses the nervous system. And so you get less and less nervous system control. So the person will seem very tired, lethargic. They may seem confused. They may seem drunk because they're not really processing things the way that they should because the nervous system is having this sort of suppression effect. They may actually lose consciousness. Worst case scenario, if you don't if you don't like do something to intervene, this could actually suppress the nervous system to the point that they stop stimulating breathing. So they can end up stopping um, respirations, go into respiratory arrest, and again, death can occur. This doesn't happen at 7.34. 
right? It doesn't happen if the pH drops like a hundredth of a point. This is like the extremes. So when you start talking about patients that are down in the 7.1s, this is what you're worried about. You're worried that they're just going to stop responding altogether. If you're talking about patients where their, their, their pH is above 7.5, 7.6, then you start really worrying about like heart function. Like something could just randomly stop working because of that hyperstimulation. So there's three ways that you keep these balanced. And for 99% of people, you never have a pH imbalance. So most people never have a problem. The number one way that your body regulates pH is by the use of what are called buffers. So buffers are a weak acid and it's conjugate base or a weak base and it's conjugate acid. So they are a pair of molecules that are found in all solutions. Your blood has a buffering system. Your cells have a buffering system. You even have buffers in your saliva. Okay, pretty much all of your body fluids have a buffering component. And what the buffer does is it tries to maintain this balanced pH. Because if I have a weak acid and a conjugate base, both present, if any acid is added, the base will react with it. If any base is added, the acid reacts with it, right? So it does this equilibrium balancing so that if acid comes in, the reaction will shift. If base comes in, the reaction will shift. And the goal will be, we don't want any hydrogen ions to be produced, and that's gonna help to keep things balanced. So the best, just remember that a buffer solution, it's a pair of molecules. And the pair is going to be either a weak acid in its conjugate base, or a weak base and it's conjugate acid. In the blood, it's a weak acid and it's conjugate base. But the goal of the buffer is to stop the pH from changing by neutralizing acid and base that might get added to the liquid. So you end up with no pH change. I always just think of buffers, they're just sitting right there. Acid comes in, neutralized it. Base comes in, neutralize it, okay? And that way there's no change in the pH over time. And this is instant. Like this is going to help to like keep your pH from changing I said 99% of people never ever have a problem, never end up with a pH imbalance. It's typically somebody that is, has some significant disease, significant imbalance that can lead to acidosis or alkalosis. So here's an example. So in this, here is the buffer pair. So carbonic acid is a weak acid. The bicarb ion is a, its conjugate base. So this is the weak acid, and here's its conjugate base. So it's like equilibrium. So what happens if I add acid to this reaction? What does equilibrium say will happen? Which way will it shift? It's going to shift to the left. So if I add acid, that will cause the reaction to shift away from whatever I add. So we will take this acid and convert it to carbonic acid, which is a weak acid, part of the buffer pair. Same thing happens if I add base. If I add base, adding base will get neutralized by the carbonic acid because we know an acid in a base helps to make a salt in water. So if base comes in, the acid can neutralize it. K 
keeping that pH from changing. That's really the goal of a buffer pair. Just think of them as being two molecules that stop any acid or base that gets added from causing a change in the overall pH. So worst case scenario, what happens if the buffers get overwhelmed? What happens if there's so much acid that the buffers can't balance it? There's a couple of issues that can cause this. You can end up with what they call respiratory acidosis and you can come up or develop what they call metabolic acidosis. Anything respiratory means there's an issue with your lungs. Okay, so respiratory acidosis is acidosis because of lung issues. So in this, if you have respiratory acidosis, it is typically because you can't get rid of carbon dioxide. If you can't get rid of carbon dioxide because of lung damage, and if you look, look at some of the lists, so things like if you have pneumonia, Okay, people that had COVID that ended up having to be on ventilators, major issue, respiratory acidosis, people that have asthma because the airways close down so they can't get air in and out, people that have chronic lung disease like emphysema, all of those, just think of anything that's going to cause damage or limit the ability of gases to exchange in the lungs. We're in a mess. Hmm? So there were some people that, that said yes, that that was the, uh, a big issue. So in that, all of these, so think pneumonia, bronchitis, asthma, emphysema, anything that affects your ability to get rid of carbon dioxide can create respiratory acidosis. Rest, start shutting. This can start shutting down the nervous system, so you get really weak, tired, lethargic. They might even lose consciousness, but that's because of the lung issue. So that to fix this, you've really got to treat what the problem is. Like if they have pneumonia, then you need to like put them on steroids, get them on antibiotics, trying to decrease the inflammation in the lungs. You've really got to like treat the disorder. Whereas if it's metabolic, so a metabolic acidosis. Whenever you think respiratory acidosis or alkalosis, that means it's something that has to do with your breathing, something that has to do with gas exchange. When you're talking about metabolic, it means that your body is making or losing too much acid or base. Metabolic acidosis is typically when the body is making the body makes too much acid. This can happen with diabetes. So in di untreated diabetes mellitus, person begins to burn fat as their primary source of energy. That can create what they call keto acids. Those acids can actually end up building up to the point that the buffers can't keep up and you end up in DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis. That's a... How would you get hepatitis from so it's not that you would get hepatitis, it's if you have hepatitis, okay? So if you have renal disease, so normally your kidneys flush out extra acids. It's one of the jobs of filtering that the kidney does. So if you have kidney disease, then your kidneys are not getting rid of it, and it can build up to an extreme. So that's renal disease. Hepatitis and cirrhosis... Remember, that's when the liver is not functioning like it should. So normally what the liver does is it takes and it can convert waste molecules and send it to the kidneys to get rid of it. But if the liver is not working, then those waste molecules build up and that's how you end up with excess acids in the blood. So it's not that the, it doesn't cause hepatitis, it's that hepatitis can cause metabolic acidosis, just because the liver is not functioning. So non-functioning kidneys, non-functioning liver, all examples of those. Even in some cases of hyperthyroidism, remember that controls metabolism. So very high metabolism can also, in extreme cases, create metabolic acidosis. 
treatment with this is they typically give them sodium bicarbonate to try and control it. But they, again, they've got to treat the disorder because otherwise it's just going to come back. So if they're a diabetic, you've got to get them on insulin. You've got to get them out of that diabetic ketoacidosis condition. If it's kidney disease, maybe they need to go through dialysis. Try to flush out the waste molecules. If it's liver disease, treatment of that liver disease, trying to get those numbers down. These are the two that you're going to see all the time. <laughs> then healthcare, you're going to see acidosis because of respiratory issues. You're going to see acidosis because of things that are not functioning correctly in the body. Patients that have sepsis. So sepsis goes over here. Okay, because when the body is inf infected, so sepsis is when you have bacteria in the bloodstream. So that means that you have an infection that has gotten into body fluids. So that causes cell death. And when cells die, they pop open and all of their waste molecules get dumped into, the, into body fluids. And those are acids. So all these acids just begin building up, building up, building up. These are the ones you really do see the most in terms of trying to treat patients. Respiratory alkalosis and metabolic alkalosis, they, they're just very rare, okay? Respiratory alkalosis, if somebody hyperventilates, they can breathe too fast and get rid of too much carbon dioxide, and that can cause respiratory alkalosis. They're like, if you notice, like their treatment, just trying to get them to calm down, right? Like breathing into a paper bag, which is not the best plan in the world, but, you know, like... Like every other breath might not be too bad. But if you just put a bag in your mouth and you just breathe in and out, in and out, in and out, you're just rebreathing all that CO2 and you can actually put yourself in respiratory acidosis doing that. So it's never really the best plan. Calming that person down. If you've ever been with somebody that's had an anxiety attack, that kind of sensation where they feel like they can't catch their breath. And so their respirations are like, you know, 40 a minute where they're just... <laughs> that they're just going to get very lightheaded. That oxygen level goes down or sorry, in their carbon dioxide levels go down. Worst case scenario, they're going to pass out. Just make sure they don't hurt themselves. Okay. Metabolic alkalosis. This one is even more rare. You really don't see this unless a patient comes in that has had like uncontrolled vomiting. So that can happen. Like if somebody has a flu like I'm, I'm sure you've had a 24 hour bug where it was like, you can keep anything down. You worry about dehydration, but you also worry that they, by all that vomiting, they're losing stomach acid. And so they can end up having alkalosis, too much base compared to acid because of loss of stomach acid. So with that, most of the time, it's just a matter of treating, giving them meds to stop whatever's causing, stopping the vomiting, and then giving them IV fluids to try and hydrate them. And also just using physiological, that'll help bring everything back into balance. So those top ones are really the big ones. So the last thing, buffers. Like I said, the number one way, 99% of the time, buffers are going to keep your pH between 7.35 and 7.45 in that range. If there's too much acid or base in the blood, your lungs can help. So if there's too much acid, you can breathe a little faster and it'll get rid of more carbon dioxide, which is acid in the blood. If you have not enough carbon dioxide, then you'll actually start breathing slower, okay? So you'll breathe slower to try and increase the amount. Your kidneys are really the backup. The kidneys don't do this instantly, but the kidneys can filter out excess acid, filter out excess base to try and maintain this balance. But your kidneys just don't do it like this, right? So the kidneys are going to take hours, Right? So if you go eat a really salty meal, you get all like, you get your puffy hands and feet, and it takes like 12 hours for that to go away. Okay? Same thing here. Too much acid or base. The kidneys need some time. They don't do this filtration in minutes. It's going to end up taking hours. So I always think of buffers as being always there. The respiration changes are kind of the backup. And then the kidneys long term can help to balance out changes in acids and bases. Okay, so that's kind of the application, the application stuff about the acids and bases and equilibrium and such. So this one will be posted 
chapter 10 is looking at the last of the nutrient molecules. So these are proteins, right? So we've talked about carbohydrates. We talked about sugars and we talked about starches. We've talked about fatty acids, triglycerides. We talked about lipids, about fats and oils and their characteristics. This is actually like a cartoon that Mr. Awadal sent me. And he was like, here, you have to put this in your, in your protein lecture. What do you call it? an acid with an, alba, an additive? It's amino acid. You'll see. <laughs> if that makes no sense, it'll make more sense later. <laughs> so proteins. Proteins are somewhat like those polysaccharides because they're polymers. They have got long chains of building blocks, but their building blocks are the amino acids. Okay? So amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. For humans, it's different for different animals, but for humans, we have 20. 20 different amino acids. Some proteins are really small. There are some proteins that are only like eight amino acids in length. And then there are some proteins that are 400 amino acids in size. So there's a lot of variation. There can be little ones and there can be really large ones. But again, that order is what's going to determine the structure of the protein and determine what it does. So we're going to look at the structure of amino acids and then how amino acids are put together as into proteins and then what kind of shapes those proteins might have. We are going to talk about this. This is sort of like all of the functions of proteins. So we will talk about protein as a channel, proteins as um, carriers, proteins for movement. We'll talk about all the eight basic functions of proteins that they have. So we'll cover those as we go. So when you hear the word amino acid, amino, do you remember amino? Amines and amides, those were the two functional groups that had what? What atom did they have that none of the other ones had? Amines and amides. Do you remember that in the functional group? Way back in chapter four. Amines and amides have, uh -huh. they're the only functional groups with nitrogen. So remember if you just had a nitrogen hanging off or if a nitrogen had a double bond oxygen on an adjacent carbon. So that's where the amine part of the name comes from because you see there's a nitrogen on the end. Every amino acid has a nitrogen. Every amino acid also has that C double bond oxygen, single bond oxygen on that end, which is kind of like a carboxylic acid. So that's where the name amino acid comes from. So the amino part is the nitrogen, and the other side is this carbon that has those two oxygens attached. So nitrogen on one side, carbon with two oxygens on the other side. The middle carbon, though, is kind of a special carbon. This middle carbon has a nitrogen group. It has a carbon with two oxygen group. It has a hydrogen. So three of the four groups are different. If all four groups are different, that carbon is what? Chiral. Mm -hmm. So this, for almost all amino ac acids, this is a chiral carbon. Remember, chiral just means that all four groups connected are different. So you know what a hydrogen is. You know what a nitrogen is. You know what a carbon with two oxygens is. What is this R? <laughs> so see that hanging down there is this thing they labeled as R. So R, the word R, this actually came from, the, was called the residue. That's how it ended up with its name R. Maybe also because there is no R element on the periodic table. So that wasn't a bad one to choose. So it wouldn't get like confused with an element that's there. This R group is what makes the 20 amino acids different. So all amino acids have that nitrogen, carbon, carbon. What they differ in is what that R is. So like in showing you this one, so see how that we have chiral carbon in that center carbon. So we could make the mirror image and they're not superimposable. So do you remember that this was the case with sugars? So remember that D-glucose, D-glucose, the most abundant sugar that is found, this is your blood sugar. So this is that form that, that, that glucose takes. It's a D form. And I told you that almost all sugars are D. Kind of interesting. 
almost all amino acids are L. That there's very, very few that are found. They're always the L form. And it's all based on that chiral carbon position. So I said, all right, so we've got this R group. The R group is the one part of these 20 amino acids that vary. And what the structure of the R group is really determines is this if the amino acid is hydrophilic or hydrophobic. Remember, hydrophilic means that it likes to interact with water. Hydrophobic means that it does not. It's really like the big classification. So you can say that you have R groups that are nonpolar or hydrophobic. You can have R groups that are ionic or polar or hydrophilic. So I do not expect you to memorize their names. I do not expect you to memorize their structure, okay? But here are six amino acids. All of them are nonpolar because of their R group, okay? So if we look, and maybe it'll let me do it, sometimes it does. Thank you, bye. All right, so there's glycine. So glycine, do you notice this NCCOO? right? See the beige box? All of them have that, okay? That is the basic structure of all amino acids, that they have a nitrogen, a carbon, and a carbon with two oxygens. So that beige, oh, one way, that beige, you can see it in all six of those. The purple box is the part that's different. That's the R group. So that purple box is the R group. The nonpolar amino acids are going to have R groups that are nothing but carbon and hydrogen. And remember that carbon and hydrogen, those are the hydrocarbons and those are the nonpolar molecules. So glycine only has a hydrogen. Alanine just has a methyl group. See the CH3? That's on the one to the right. Then coming down, valine is the next one, and it's got three carbons with, a, with the, kind of like a branch to it. Leucine, the one next to it, has four carbons with a branch but it's nothing but carbons and hydrogen in the purple areas. And that's really the kicker. Let's see if it'll let me, nope. <laughs> that makes me angry. <laughs> okay, but if you look at them, nothing but carbon and hydrogen in the R group means that that R group is gonna be considered hydrophobic and nonpolar. Isoleucine, the one that I really wanted to show you, do because we talked about this, is phenylalanine, the one that's down here. So phenylalanine is actually an aromatic. Do you remember the aromatic group? See how it's a six-membered ring with that little circle on the inside? Phenylalanine, again, a nonpolar hydrophobic amino acid, but this is the amino acid that builds up in a person that has PKU. Remember we talked about enzymes, if you're missing enzymes, one of the enzymes that you could be missing, and this happens like you're born with this, where you don't have an enzyme to break down this amino acid, and since you don't have this enzyme, phenylalanine builds up and causes neurological changes. So it actually inhibits development of normal neurological like brain structure, and so this can lead to permanent mental retardation. That's why they test you for PKU when you're born, and if you have PKU, they put you on a low phenylalanine diet. And once you grow out of it, you're okay. You kind of like, once you get to like not growing stage, then it's not as big of a deal as it is during infancy and childhood. But that's one I wanted to show you. So the thing to remember is the nonpolar amino acids, they're hydrophobic, because they have non a nonpolar R group. These are the last three. This one's very appropriate because of this week. So there's methionine, proline, and tryptophan. So if you look methionine up at the top, it actually has a sulfur. That is one of the sulfur-containing amino acids. There's only two of them out of 20. Do you see the sulfur in there? So remember, that would be a thiol. Then we have proline. Proline's kind of interesting because it forms like its own little ring. And then tryptophan. So tryptophan, it's an aromatic. It does have a nitrogen in there, but because it's got so many carbons, it's really still nonpolar. So 
Tryptophan is high in concentration in turkey meat. And so this has always been associated with when you have Thanksgiving dinner, you're always tired afterwards, like you're kind of sleepy, you want to take a nap. I think it has to do with the 3,000 calories that you ate in one sitting, and so that's probably why you're tired and need to take a nap. But an interesting thing is tryptophan. There's the structure of tryptophan. It is easily converted into a molecule called serotonin. So serotonin is a brain neurotransmitter. Serotonin is considered a the neurotransmitter that is associated with a calm, happy, peaceful type of mood. People that have low serotonin levels sometimes suffer from what? Anger. It's not anger so much as depression. depression. Mm -hmm. So low levels of serotonin. So having a little tryptophan in your life is maybe not such a bad thing because tryptophan can be converted to serotonin. Huh? <laughs> so having a little turkey every once in a while can naturally increase your serotonin levels. So not such a bad thing. So people that take stuff like Prozac, so Prozac actually just makes serotonin stay in those neuron synapses longer to help promote this sort of mood leveling effect. But they're very similar. Serotonin and tryptophan look a lot alike. Like if you look at the molecule on the far left and you look over at the molecule on the far right, there's a couple of parts different, but there's a lot of similarities between the two of them. Okay, so we have a total of nine nonpolar amino acids, all because there are groups are nothing but carbons and hydrogen. Then we've got six that are polar, hydrophilic. Polar because they've got oxygens. Polar because they've got nitrogens. This means that they're going to want to interact with water, right? Instead of being hydrophobic, these are the hydrophilic. If they have nitrogen and oxygen in their R group, then they're going to want to interact with water. There's the other sulfur-containing amino acid. So you can see the thiol here. So that's called cysteine. So cysteine and methionine, those are the only two that have sulfur. But if you slide down, so see how glutamine, see how it's got a nitrogen and an oxygen on there. So that's going to want to interact with water, making it a polar hydrophilic type of amino acid. So we have nine nonpolar, six that are polar. So that leaves five. So there are... Why do I keep doing that? It just decides it's not going to change slides. The last five are charged. So these are actually ionic. Okay? So when looking this like aspartate, glutamate, lysine, histidine, arginine, looking at... Let's just blow this one up. Goodbye. Well, maybe not. Maybe this one. So see how that one oxygen on the end has a charge? So now this is going to act like an ionic compound. So this is going to be really hydrophilic. Down here, we have arginine that's actually got, I was supposed to show me that one. You can actually see it's got three nitrogens. One of them has a charge to it. Very hydrophilic, very hydrophilic likes to interact with water. These are not going to interact with the nonpolar amino acids, right? This is going to be like, like oil and water kind of thing. They're going to like completely try to separate. When you see amino acids, a couple of ways you might see them written. So you might see the whole name. So there's the 20. That's their whole name. Cysteine, histidine, isoleucine, methionine, serine, valine, alanine, glycine, Okay, but because it's kind of a pain to write it out like that, oftentimes they use what they call the three letter code. So when we talk about that in DNA with protein synthesis, you'll see like just CYS, which stands for cysteine, or GLY stands for glycine, or MET stands for methionine. Okay, so those three letters is really just an abbreviation for the entire um, name. In fact, there's even, and I don't know all of these, there's even a one-letter code. This kind of came out, came about after me, after I got out of school. A one-letter code so that they can just use one letter to count for an amino acid. So just don't let that, like, like especially in chapter um, 11, you'll see, like, GL, 
U or P-R-O or C-Y-S. All that's talking about is that is an amino acid, but it's just this short version, the three-letter code for it. So where do you get these? So where do you get the building blocks for proteins? For the most part, you always think of you get your amino acids, you get proteins from what? Meat, right? Because meat is skeletal muscle. <laughs> and muscle is almost entirely composed of protein. Okay, so the vast majority of your protein intake comes from some type of meat. So whether you're talking about chicken or fish or pork or beef, all of those count. In fact, meat is what they call a complete protein. Complete proteins have all of the amino acids that you can't make. So adults, we have eight what are called essential amino acids. Out of the 20 amino acids, we can make 12. We cannot make these eight, which means you have to have them in your diet. All animal meat contains these eight essential amino acids. And so that's why they say that meat is a complete protein. So beef, chicken, pork, even eggs, milk, those being from an animal product, those actually have enough protein to become considered a complete protein. Incomplete protein means it's missing one or more of those essential amino acids. So what about people that are vegetarians? If you're like hardcore vegetarian, you don't eat any kind of animal product. And so if you don't eat any kind of, that's an animal, there are like hardcore vegans that don't eat anything that ever breathed, walked, walked, nothing. And they don't eat anything from, hmm? you can be a, what they call a pescatarian, which is a, a vegetarian that eats fish. Okay. They don't count. <laughs> okay. But they can still get all of their amino acids by eating two things. They have to make sure that they get a combination of plant proteins. So you have to have grains. So grains, they have five of the eight amino, essential amino acids. So any kind of grain, okay? So you can talk about wheat, you could talk about rice, you could talk about oats, you could talk about, you know, like all of the ancient grains, any kind of grain type, you're going to get five of the eight essential amino acids. And how they get those other three is by eating beans. So they call them legumes. Legumes are beans. So these are like navy beans, black beans, kidney beans, Peanuts. Peanuts are actually a bean, even though people call them a peanut. So they're actually a bean type. So like edamame beans, soybeans, any kind of bean type, those all fall into the, the legume category. And they actually have the other. So a true vegetarian will not end up being protein deficient as long as they eat a combination of grains and legumes, beans and grains. But in fact, peanut butter and jelly, that is actually a complete protein because bread is made from flour. So that will give you five of your essential amino acids and then peanuts are actually a bean. And so that would give you the other three. So you can think of a lot of like cultures where beans and rice is kind of a normal combination like red beans and rice, black beans and rice. And the reason is, is because the grain is giving you part, part of your essential amino acids and then those beans are giving you the other. Because in a lot of cultures, meat is almost like cost prohibitive. Like you, they, you can't afford meat. You don't have good refrigeration. And so the amount of meat they eat in a day is very small and compared to the average American diet. But they get their proteins by having a combination of grains and legumes. Okay, so that's how, that's how vegetarians survive the world. <laughs> so then the, what time is it? All right. 
So we'll just do, we'll do the primary structure and we'll quit. So the way that proteins are put together is amino acids have to be linked. So amino acids are linked by a bond called a peptide bond. This is a condensation reaction. Remember, condensation reactions always form what? Think of condensation forms. Condensation on your window is what? It's water, mm -hmm. right? So remember that condensation reactions always form water. So this is what happens. There is a hydrogens pulled off of the nitrogen group. There is an oxygen pulled off of the carbon with the two oxygen group. So I'm gonna pull this oxygen and these two hydrogens off. All three of those come together, H, H, and O, combine and form water. Pulling the oxygen off of the the left amino acid, pulling those two hydrogens off of the right amino acid is going to then allow a bond to form between the carbon and the nitrogen. So this link here, that's the connection, the peptide bond that links these two amino acids together. So I pull an oxygen off of one side, two hydrogens off of the other side, we make water and link these two together. So you remember condensation reactions, how we build molecules, taking two molecules, putting them together. Water is always a product. So let's practice that here. So one, two, three, four. There's four amino acids. So this is amino acid one, two, three, and four. And I don't even have the actual R groups. I just put them as R1, R2, R3, because it doesn't matter what the R group is. This is how they get linked together. So amino acid one, there's amino acid one, amino acid number one, and it has a nitrogen, carbon, carbon. So do you see that? Sticking off of the nitrogen, the nitrogen on this end has four, three hydrogens and it's a positive charge. That's that amino side, the nitrogen end. The middle carbon always has a hydrogen and has the R group because that's that center carbon. The end carbon has the two oxygens, but one of the oxygens, the single bonded oxygen gets pulled off to make water. So that just leaves the double bonded oxygen behind. So this, now you just draw just a straight line because I'm taking these hydrogens off. So now there's just a straight line to the next nitrogen. That nitrogen is going to have a hydrogen. The middle carbon still has its hydrogen with its R group. This is amino acid number two. That carbon is connected to the second carbon. It ends up with the double bond oxygen, so it's just like the one above. But now I'm pulling the oxygen off of the end. Two hydrogens off of the next nitrogen. That's going to make water, and we're now forming a link. So now there's a link. The next nitrogen has a hydrogen. Middle carbon has a hydrogen and an R group. End carbon has a what? Double bond oxygen. Mm -hmm. So you see sort of like the repetitive, you have nitrogen, carbon, carbon, linked to a nitrogen, carbon, carbon, linked to a nitrogen, carbon, carbon. That is how you make a protein. Is every time you form a peptide bond, you remove an eight, two H's and an oxygen, and that forms that link between the two. So the last one, what comes next? N, and the N has an H sticking up. The N is connected to a C, sticking up is an H, and down below would be the R4, right? So that would be the fourth amino acids R group. And then on the end, mm -hmm. so this one, because it's not connected to anything, that oxygen is still on that end, okay? So they would call that the nitrogen end, and they would call that the carbon end. Okay, so there is actually like a direction. So there, there's nitrogen on one end of a protein, carbon on the opposite end. But this order is what they call the primary structure. The primary structure is the order that the amino acids are linked together in this long chain. So here's an application for this. Some people develop allergies to things that are not a problem. <laughs> but for some reason, your body goes, 
this is bad. <laughs> so what happens for people that develop what they call celiac disease. So celiac disease is when your immune system reacts to proteins that are found in certain grains, found in wheat, found in oats, found in barley, okay? And that protein is called gluten, okay? So I know that you've probably heard the term gluten because gluten has had like a really bad, bad rap for the last 10 years. Like gluten is terrible for you, <laughs> okay? But most people don't know what gluten actually is. So gluten is a protein. So when you eat like bread, okay? So you eat bread, chew it up, swallow it. As soon as it hits your stomach, stomach acid and enzymes in your stomach start breaking the gluten, big protein, into smaller pieces. Some of these gluten fragments actually are seen as foreign. So these protein pieces go down, they start in the stomach, it was real big, and it just basically gets chopped into smaller pieces. Then it goes down into the small intestine, and in the small intestine, there are immune system cells that like watch what goes by. And these immune system cells go, this shouldn't be here, this is foreign, this is dangerous, and actually creates an immune reaction so that your small <laughs> intestine becomes inflamed. This leads to damage. People d complain of having like stomach pains, abdominal pains, cramping, gas, bloating, nausea. Like they get to the point where they just don't even eat. Like I just, any, it seems like anything I eat because once you have like this immune response, it actually takes a while for it to calm back down. And so then even if you're not eating gluten, it's still like everything that goes down your small intestine just gets all inflamed. So here's what actually ends up happening. Your immune system begins to try and that like attack and destroy this gluten as it's passing along through the small intestine, but it ends up damaging the walls of the small intestine. So normal villi, so I always think of the small intestine looks like this, right? So nutrients come down and they go around those little finger-like projections. Every time nutrients hit those fingers, they can get absorbed. But... When gluten is present here, this creates this inflammatory reaction and those villi begin to disappear. So now your small intestine lining is like this. And so food moves through and it never hits the wall. And if it doesn't hit the wall, it's not gonna get, di it's not gonna get absorbed. So people that have truly have celiac disease, they end up having malnutrition. So the food they eat, even if they're eating food that has no gluten in it, they're not absorbing as much because they don't have those villi anymore. So they don't have the ability of the nutrients to kind of get down into the little, little clefts of those fingers. That causes malabsorption. And these people, like, you'll see them, and then two months later you see them, and they've dropped like 30 pounds. And you're like, what happened? Have you been on a diet? <laughs> Usually it's like, no, I have celiac disease. And when they get a flare, it can sometimes take months to get the small intestine kind of like calm down because it gets all inflamed. So you have to take like steroids to try and get it down. There's meds that you can take to try and keep it from being so reactive. But people that have true celiac disease, they try to avoid anything with gluten. So that's kind of hard because wheat has gluten. Think of everything that you eat in the course of the day that's made from wheat. So any kind of bread, cereals, crackers, chips, mm -hmm. anything that's from, well, potatoes, no. Glute, there's no gluten in potatoes and there's no gluten in rice. So that's pretty much where your life is. Mm -hmm. There is no gluten in rice. There is gluten. It's always in a grain, like in a, like a wheat grain. So rice like grows in water. It's a little bit different type of grain. It doesn't actually make gluten proteins. But wheat, barley, um, corn does not. So that's one. So sometimes you can, but you've got to like sit there and literally like read the label to make sure that there's absolutely no, no gluten containing grain types because of that malabsorption that can occur. All right, so I will quit there. If you didn't turn in your take-home test, do make sure you put it on the pile on your way out. It should get them done and